OK, should we get started? Everybody having a good build so far? You guys still awake at the end of the day? Thank you for staying late. We appreciate it. Uh, one note before we start. Uh, we're doing uh, an ARM futures discussion tomorrow with customers. We want to get kind of a, a more in-depth idea of how you guys are using ARM, how we can improve ARM all up. Obviously, services like policy and blueprints um, are better when ARM is better. So the more that we can do there, um, we're very interested in doing that. So um, if you uh, want to participate, please sign up at aka.ms slash mybuild. Anil here has three glorious Starbucks gift cards that he will give out to a lucky few of you. Um, and uh, it'll be here at the Sheraton Hotel. Um, tomorrow afternoon, aka.ms, my build. Okay, so the topic for today is implementing control at scale in a cloud and DevOps-centric environment using policy and blueprints. It's really tight. Um, uh, Liz Kim is down here. She'll be presenting on policy and resource graph. Um, and my name is Alex Frankel, and we're both program managers on the governance team. So just a quick note on uh, who this is for. Basically, uh, if you need to control an environment, but you want to enable the application teams that you service uh, to consume the cloud at sort of um, the scale that you would expect and you would hope. Um, so if you're uh, helping multiple engineering teams that are deploying and operating uh, many subscriptions, a dev and test subscription and a pre-prod and a prod subscription, um, and you need to standardize and enforce how cloud resources are configured, whether that's for uh, a variety of compliance certifications or for costs or for security or for uh, a host of design patterns that I'm sure you guys have been working on for a long time now. Does that sound like you guys? Cool. Um, so kind of the overarching theme of what we're going to be trying to do today is setting up a governed environment in under an hour. So we've been working really hard to make governance easier and easier to implement, um, whether you're a small organization or a large organization. Um, we're going to be talking about the, the techniques that we use to implement uh, governance, um, whether it's um, an existing environment that's sort of been ungoverned for a while, or it's a net new environment that you want to set up with governance from the start. Um, so this is kind of the before that we see with a lot of customers. So it's a, it's a variety of subscriptions that all serve different purposes. They have overlapping but inconsistent policy and RBAC on them because this environment has grown organically and you've sort of solved problems in an ad hoc way for a long time, but you've probably started to realize that this is not working, this is not scaling for me. And this is what we are um, helping our customers do every day. So we're talking to large customers all the time and we're trying to move them from this before to this after. And what you're seeing here, and we'll ta obviously talk about in more detail, um, is a, a well thought through management group hierarchy. So that's what the sort of bracketed um, icons are. Um, and then taking advantage of the inheritance model of the Azure management group and subscription hierarchy so that the policies and the RBAC that you set up at the top of your hierarchy will inherit down um, no matter what level you're doing that at. So um, if you can be strategic about where you're applying policy and RBAC and blueprints, that should reduce your management overhead, which makes it easier to scale out as you're bringing on new environments every day. Um, I'm going to go into the portal in just a second, but I want to talk about sort of how we think about um, setting up a management group and subscription hierarchy to help with scale. Um, so at the top, you have an organizational management group. This is where you should be mapping your organizational hierarchy. Um, depending on the organization, uh, that org management group could be many management groups. It could have multiple levels of hierarchy. That's much more dependent on sort of how your organization is set up. Um, what we spent a lot of time thinking and caring about are these second two management groups that sit below the organizational management group. Um, so basically what we're doing here is we've split out the management groups into production and pre-production. And again, that's to take advantage of the inheritance model so that when you're applying um, production, RBAC, and policy, 
to a management group, that will inherit down to all the production uh, subscriptions that you place into it. So as you're bringing on new environments, you put the prod subscription in the prod management group, you put the pre-prod subscription in the pre-prod management group, and there should be quite a bit less of uh, RBAC and policy overhead that you will be managing. Um, in each of these, there's a shared services subscription, so those are things like Key Vault, uh, Log Analytics, um, central networking that might have on-prem connectivity that I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Um, and again, we're splitting that out over prod and pre-prod because the access rights for those sorts of things should be different. So I forgot to include a little demo slide, but I'm gonna switch over. So uh, what I'm showing here, let me zoom in a little bit, is a pretty simple management group uh, hierarchy that I was setting up earlier today. So this is within the retail uh, organization of my uh, organization, Very Successful Hotels Incorporated. Um, and then within that retail management group, I have dev test and pre-prod and prod. Um, and the idea here is, is pretty straightforward is that um, in my prod management group, I have my prod subscriptions. And in my pre-prod management group, I have my pre-prod subscriptions. If it sounds simple, it is, it's because it is simple. Management groups are actually quite good at, um, in terms of flexibility of being able to move subscriptions around. And so my pre-prod subscription already has the, or my pre-prod management group already has the policies in RBAC that I want. And so the, the act of governing a subscription is really the act of moving the subscription under this management group. How many of you guys have started using management groups at all? Okay, a good number of you, that's great. So I have my Contoso retail subscription, but I also wanna move my Contoso um, SH360 pre-prod. Management groups have been having a bit of an issue today, so we're gonna roll the dice here and see if this works. Um, but usually this just takes a couple of seconds. I can move, and there it is. Um, uh, I can move the subscription under the management group, and then as soon as I've done that, all of those policies and all that RBAC will start to inherit down. So you, of course, wanna be careful with those moves because that could um, change how that uh, subscription uh, is being governed. So if you have any automated pipelines going or anything like that, the act of moving that subscription may affect those pipelines. So do be considerate of making a move like that. So that's the first demo. And then Liz is gonna come up and talk about policy in more detail. Awesome, thanks Alex. Hello, can everyone hear me okay? Awesome, how many of you are using Azure policy today? Oh, majority of you, okay. Okay, great. Um, so I'll go really quick in terms of the um, functionalities of Azure policy. If you're interested, we have a YouTube channel called Microsoft Azure Governance, and those go through in more depth in terms of the concepts, kind of how you get started um, in more introduction, uh, introductory levels. So in terms of the functionalities of Azure Policy, we have three main pillars. One is around our real-time enforcement and compliance assessment. And so uh, before the resource actually get created, we evaluate everything by policy first. And so we are the only cloud that is able to offer deny before the resource creation across your Azure resources. Uh, the second portion is around the compliance assessment. And so that's uh, two parts. One is around Delta scan every time a resource change, we'll evaluate that particular resource to update the compliance state. Second portion is around um, our full scan. So every 24 hours, just in case there was a drift we did not catch, we will run full scans every 24 hours across all of your resources to make sure that your compliance state is up to date. The second portion is around applying policies at scale which leverages management group. And so through a single assignment, as Alex has went over earlier, um, you're, allow, you're able to impact across all of your subscriptions uh, in that one go. 
Another thing is, let's say that you have a um, initiative definition. Initiative just means grouping of policies. So let's say that you have this grouping of policies that you don't want to require, but you want to provide this content to your developers or application owners so that they can optionally use those initiatives. If you put that as policy definition at the management group level, any application owners underneath who owns a subscription or management group will be able to leverage those definitions. Furthermore, as you add additional policies over time into that initiative, the assignments will automatically inherit whatever is the latest. So you, the assignments are always keeping track of your latest um, requirements. The last portion is around integration with our Azure DevOps, uh, which I will demo shortly as well, um, so that from, developer, from developer's perspective, everything is available within the DevOps experience. With that, I'll, uh, this slide is available, it's been uploaded, and so um, I won't touch too much details on here, but here's some of the popular policies that our customers have been using. Um, so there's the ones related to restricting your location uh, or your resource types, like public IP addresses, or tags related items, so like automatically inheriting your tags from your resource group, or appending your, uh, appending your resource to always have cost code tag, um, that sort of deal. Um, you don't want to have open to any rules on your network security group, some of the monitoring related policies as well as security and regulatory compliance. With that, I'm just going to jump into the demo. We will try our best to leave some time at, for Q&A at the end, uh, so that if you have any more questions, uh, you can ask at that point as well. So let me first show you in terms of what enforcement on policy looks like. Uh, so today, when you go through the VM create experiences, it's uh, something very familiar to you. I've already filled in everything, and then when I click on to review and create, you'll see that running final validation. Yeah. Thank you. You can see that the validation has failed, um, and so when I click on to view additional details, you can see here it gives a specific details of why this resource has failed, right? So resource, my VM, was disallowed by policy, and here's a link. When you click onto the link, it will show you the assignment details so that you can have information like uh, what were the allowed SKUs for my virtual machine, as well as who's assigned this virtual machine, what scope is it targeting, all that stuff. So you can see all the details of assigned by, the parameters that are allowed, through, all that stuff. Now, let's say that, um, okay, now I've learned my lesson. I'm not allowed to create, uh, I'm only allowed to create A and B series VMs. So now I'm going to go back to the VM create experience and change my SKU to B series. Now it's going to run the validation one more time. Validation pass. Great, I'm going to create my virtual machine. Now, a lot of the times when people are creating these resources, there are small details and knobs they forget to do, like enabling diagnostic logs. Because you have to do it at a, every single resource level, you may forget to enable diagnostic logs. Or they may be, there may be tags that you require that sometimes people forget to put in, right? So in this example, I'm trying to create my virtual machine, and what I did is I put in a policy that automatically inherits my tag from my resource group. So once the deployment has finished, I'll be able to see that as when the VM got created, uh, not only did the VM get created, but the tags are already in place. And the activity log will reflect as such as well. I'm going to let it um, keep getting created. I'm just going to switch over to the policy experience for now. So this is what Azure policy experience looks like. Uh, on, when you search for policy, it will just show up over there for you to uh, drill down into. For brand new customers, when you get started, we already have quite a few built-in definitions. And so, for example, the earlier view that you saw on tag, if I just search for it, and let me just show you the built-ins, you can see that we already have the tag-related policies in there, including the one that inherits from the resource group. Let me also show you um, what it takes to evaluate against the regulatory compliance controls as well. 
So in this example, I have a built-in control for regulatory compliance, ISO 27001. And just by simply assigning this policy, now I am evaluated against 63 policies to help me become audited against the ISO 27001. We also have a documentation that goes hand in hand so that you can understand how a control is mapped to these policies as well. Assigning is fairly straightforward. You would just provide a scope, fill in the content of a parameter value and assign it. But looks like given that most of you are already using policy, you are familiar with this assignment experience. So let me switch over to the compliance view. Once you've assigned a policy, uh, what you'll see is the breakdown of your compliance state across these individual um, policies. Not only do we provide a compliant, po non-compliant policies, but we also show you the compliant policies. Additionally, you can also see the compliant resources as well as your non-compliant resources so that you have full fidelity of your um, environment. Now, this is all great from the someone who's actually assigned these policies, fully aware of what these policies are doing. Like, I know that, okay, I'm getting evaluated. I can see the compliance state. I can see what's at scale, all that stuff, right? But let's think about the developers where when you put in the deny policy, they actually have no clue that this deny policy went in, right? Uh, you try your best to email them, um, but, but they may not have been aware of it. When we switch over to what it looks like within the Azure DevOps experience, you can see over here as a part of, um, it'll show as a part of your um, deployment where the resource that I'm trying to deploy, uh, the web app, actually was disallowed by policy. So the experience that you saw earlier, the similar experiences available within the Azure DevOps experience, as well as the link as you can see to the assignment blade that you just saw earlier, for the developer to get additional details, like who assigned it, what is the scope that it's targeting. Aside from that, now let's say that I'm making changes to my uh, resource group, and I wanna make sure that the application that I'm about to deploy is compliant against the, um, against the policies that I'm assessed against, right? Um, in that case, we just release our gate for you to be able to evaluate the compliance state. So it's a part of my release, you can see here that I've actually failed all of my compliance for my, uh, the compliance state for my policies. <laughs> for you to enable the gate, we've provided as a built-in. So today when you go into the edit pipelines view, you will simply be able to add the gate by clicking onto here, enablement, and then add the deployment gate. So as you can see, once you um, click on to add, the security and compliance assessment is available over there, which allows the developer for every time they make the changes into their application to also make sure that they get audited and get evaluated against the policies and have that information all within the Azure DevOps experience. So you would just provide a delay before the, uh, the delay that you wanna do before you trigger this compliance evaluation. So let's say, um, 20 minutes after I trigger my deployments, I want to trigger the uh, latest state of the compliance assessment. And all you have to provide is the subscription and resource group. That's it. Once you provided those, we will just make sure to evaluate against all of the policies that's applied to your environment uh, from the management group down to the resource group levels as well. With that said, um, now let's go through some of the new items that we have within Azure Policy. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Azure Policy already covers all of the Azure resources at control plane, right? So all the objects that you're creating within your ARM, uh, so your network security group, VMs, all these resources by default are all covered by Azure Policy. Now we wanted to take that one level deeper and what we've invested into um, is data plane policies. And so, for example, for AKS, um, there are objects within that cluster that we are not familiar with, right? You're changing all these pods, your namespaces, your ingress, that traditionally policy was not aware of, but with our um, preview of the AKS policy, 
we are actually able to not only assess the compliance of those objects, but also do a real-time enforcement so that as a developer is trying to check in their changes, uh, whether through Azure DevOps or through the, uh, through the CLI, they will get disallowed by policy message and be able to know that, oh, I'm, got, I'm getting denied because of my policy assessment. We also have an integration that we did with Key Vault so that uh, the popular policies uh, of cert rotation is something that, you, uh, sorry, cert expiry is something that you can set policy on as well. So let me switch over to So in this example, I have um, policy assigned for my Kubernetes services. When you join the preview, uh, which you can join from the, um, when you open up the policy on the menu blade, we have a join preview available for you to select the subscriptions to onboard. Once you join the preview, all you have to do is uh, put in the add-on onto your cluster, which put, deploys, the, um, deploys the gatekeeper as well as our um, our object to be able to download the policies into your cluster so that we can start doing the real-time enforcement right away. On top of that, given that you're, uh, a lot of the customers already have these AKS clusters, we will evaluate the compliance state of all your existing objects. So here I can see that I have an initiative for requiring, uh, re uh, putting in the requirements onto my cluster, and I have some whitelisted container images unique ingress, internal load balancers only, as well as setting your resource limit for CPU and memory. If I drill down into here, you'll see a change that we've had where not only do we show it at the cluster level, but when I drill into one more level down granularity, I'm also able to see it at the component level as well. So in this case, I have a pod that is currently non-compliant. Now when I take a look at the policy definition in this case, you can see all I'm doing is a familiar if and then statement of the policy language. And then I'm enforcing this regular policy. And so if I, actually let me just do this. If I go to the page over here, here's the regular policy that a lot of the um, AKS users are already familiar with. Now that's the AKS policy. Now let me show you what the Key Vault integration looks like. When you take a look at the Key Vault, um, again, it's a familiar experience where with a single assignment, you can impact across all of your Key Vaults. But in this case, I can drill down to one of my Key Vault application to see of the, all the components which are the certificates that are currently non-compliant. Not only the non-compliant certificates, I can also see the compliant, uh, why not, oh I do, okay. Um, I can also see the compliant certificates as well um, so that I have the full fidelity. When I take a look at the policy definition, it looks just like any other policies that you're fully familiar with. And so here you can see that the field that I'm evaluating against is for the expires on. I'm checking the date of the less than equals because for this particular example, I wanna make sure that there's no certificates that are expiring too soon. But similarly, um, you can also do greater or equals in case you don't, want the, um, you don't want people to rotate the certificates too infrequently. I can put in a deny policy or I can do an audit in this case as well. So for all of these policies, we have a preview, joint preview link available right now. The key vault policy and custom ingest policies are currently in private preview, and so we are onboarding a little bit more slowly, uh, but please do register um, so that we can onboard you as the, uh, as the space becomes available. So with that, let me just quickly touch on uh, change history and non-compliance reasoning. No, come up, Alex, it's fine. Uh, so in terms of the change history, a lot of you ha may have seen the recent announcement where uh, we are currently capturing all of the changes that happened in the resource changes that happen in your Azure environment. And you can see that within the policy experience uh, where when you click onto a resource, it'll capture you all of the changes that happened in the last 14 days with the diff view of the before and the after state. 
This view is also available within your activity log so that you can also correlate the change that happened with your event information as well. The last portion is around compliance reasoning. So a lot of our customers were telling us that, hey, I got non-compliant, but my policy is becoming more and more complex. And I don't know what field actually violated. I don't know why my resource is shown as non-compliant. So for that, we have a non-compliance reasoning, which will tell you the specific field that you violated, what the expected value was, and what the current value was. And that's shown for all non-compliant resources uh, if you click on the compliance details. With that, I'll hand it over to Alex uh, to go into Blueprints. Thanks, Liz. <clears throat> okay, so uh, who's familiar with the Blueprints service? Can I get some hands? How many of you guys have, and gals, have, have assigned a blueprint? Okay, a few hands, great. Um, so, just a quick note on what Blueprints is. Um, blueprints is a, a packaging construct for your uh, Azure artifacts, is what we call them. So that's policy, uh, RBAC, and then your ARM templates. And they're designed to make your environment creation process much simpler. Um, so we talked to a lot of large enterprises and this was a major pain point because when they wanted to onboard an application team, there was a long sort of trial and error process to make sure the environment was set up correctly, the app designs were good, and so we're trying to sort of front load that into a library of blueprints um, so that you guys can create those in advance um, so that when an application team comes, you can just deploy that to the subscription um, and everything's ready to go. So uh, it helps with managing environments because it's an item potent um, definition. Um, basically, you, you package everything that you need to, to create in an environment, um, and we do that all through ARM. So everything is still item potent. So if you're familiar with how things work in ARM templates, it works the same way uh, in Blueprints. Uh, they're super easy to compose, whether that's through the UI, which is definitely a great way to get started, or you want to switch over to managing your blueprints as code. Um, so because we've broken down everything into an artifact, it makes it really easy to bring in new artifacts, kind of like Lego pieces, um, as you're solving more and more of your governance challenges or tweaking your, your sort of governance practice. Um, and same goes for when you switch over to, to code. All the artifacts are represented as separate files, so you get a really clean separation of concerns, and it makes it really easy to swap in and out uh, those artifacts in code as well, and we'll dive a, a little bit deeper into that uh, later on. And then finally, it's really important to make sure those resources are, are secured, especially for uh, really critical resources like networking, where those IP ranges and those uh, network security group rules are really, really critical to making sure the environment runs as expected. Uh, you don't want a subscription owner to be making modifications to that, um, but you do need to give them owner access so they can configure uh, RBAC and, and other things of that nature. So the Blueprint has a feature called uh, a lock, which uh, it adds something called the deny assignment to all of the resources, which essentially revokes access away. So a subscription owner can no longer modify a resource that they would otherwise be able to, um, to modify, but you still get full lifecycle control as a central body through the blueprint definition and blueprint assignment update process. Um, a quick note on some of the, the things that are new uh, with blueprints. So uh, when Blueprints launched, we were, we were pretty focused on the UI experience to make sure that um, composition in the portal was really easy and we could onboard customers quickly and easily. Um, but we're, we've since pivoted a lot to, to managing Blueprints as code because we know that when you start to operationalize these things, this becomes really critically important. Um, so about a month or two ago, we released the first version of the az.blueprint module, which we, you can find from in the PowerShell gallery. Eventually, it'll become, it'll become part of the, the proper AZ um, PowerShell module. It was mostly focused on assignments uh, for people that wanted to get their assignments into a pipeline. Um, and then this week, maybe next week, we're going to have an update to this module to do full Blueprint definition CRUD um, operation so that you can really oper operation, operationalize not just the assignments of the blueprint, but the creation and the ongoing management of the blueprint definitions uh, themselves. Uh, we also added support for passing values between artifacts. So if you create a virtual network, you want to get the output of the VNet uh, resource ID so that any VMs that get created later on in the blueprint process can reference that virtual network ID. So the artifacts function enables you to pass values um, between any of your artifacts. It's, it's, it's quite powerful. 
Um, and then the last one, which I will be demoing, is a DevOps extension for Blueprints. It'll have a create task and an assign task, which makes it just trivially easy um, to manage your Blueprints as code and then start assigning Blueprints at scale uh, in a pipeline. So we're pretty excited about this one. And let's switch over to a demo. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about three things in the demo. Um, what govern looks like, so okay, you did all of these things, you applied the policies, the RBAC, you applied the blueprint with a lock. What does that look like on the other end? What is my sort of day-to-day -day, uh, experience? Um, then we're gonna be talking about sort of setting up a hub and spoke architecture, so this is a pretty common pattern. Can you raise your hand if you guys have heard of the hub and spoke architecture? Okay, awesome. Um, so uh, it's a great architecture, can take time to set up. So we have built in blueprints now to make this really, really easy and also uh, certified um, uh, to ISO 2701 compliance. It's meant to jumpstart uh, that ISO certification process. And then we'll talk about managing blueprints as code in a pipeline. Okay. So what govern looks like? Let me collapse this a little bit. Um, so this is a, a blueprint that was assigned earlier today um, to one of my subscriptions. Uh, its job is to set up networking. Networking is a great use case for blueprints because it's a lot of different um, components that make up a, a, a proper uh, networking setup. Um, so in here you can see I have a policy for tagging resources, but also a network security group, a VNet, a public IP address, all those sorts of components that you're used to. If you're doing express route connectivity, it gets even more complicated. So it's a really great use case for blueprints. And I have the lock on all of these resources. So you can see the lock state it a little bigger. Uh, you can see the lock state of read only. Um, that means read only. So um, I'm an owner on this subscription. I have as high privilege as I can possibly get. Um, I'm gonna go into this network security group. I've decided that I don't really like it. It's making my production deployment hard. So I'm just gonna delete it. And this is uh, the sort of error that you'll see. Um, basically it says, hey, I, I failed to delete this. What it says is, hey, this client uh, has permission to perform this action normally, but in this case, it's being denied because of a deny assignment because of this blueprint assignment. So if you need to go and figure out, okay, how do I get either an exception or how do I get the lock removed or how do I make sure that the modifications to the resource can happen so I can do my production deployment, you have the information uh, here. This will fail whether you go through the portal or you go through the API directly or you go through PowerShell. It's built right into ARM uh, identity. The next thing uh, I want to talk about is uh, using those built-in blueprints. So as I said, heading, setting up a hub and spoke uh, architecture while great can be time consuming. There's quite a bit uh, involved in a process like that. Um, so what we did was partner uh, with an internal team that works with um, our largest customers that's building out these architectures every day, and they are the ones who designed uh, these built-in blueprints. So they're really battle-tested, they're proven architectures. Where you'll see it is if you choose to create a blueprint in the portal, you'll see a screen like this. <coughs> So you'll see at the top that you can start with a blank blueprint and start from scratch and add whatever artifacts you want. Um, or you can choose one of these samples. So we have some basic samples here for helping you get started with kind of simpler architecture patterns. So a set of common policies that are popular, um, basic networking setup, or setting up kind of a simple resource group um, setup within a subscription uh, with RBAC already set up. Uh, but we wanna talk about are these two ISO blueprints. So we have one called uh, Shared Services. Um, so we can open up this documentation link and learn a little bit more about it. Um, basically, it just sets up everything you would need in a hub. So it sets up log analytics, it sets up key vault, it sets up networking with the right firewall rules. You can learn all about it um, in this documentation. Here's a rough um, screenshot of the architecture as it stands today. Um, if you're doing anything Greenfield or setting up a net new environment, this is a really great place to, to get started. 
the hub subscription I've actually already set up and, and deployed. Um, the one we're gonna walk through is using this ASC SQL workload. So if you already have the hub set up, the next thing you wanna do is set up an environment to work with that hub, or, or a spoke as we call it. So let's click on the sample for app services and SQL. By choosing a built-in blueprint, I'm essentially cloning a copy of this blueprint into my tenant. So I still need to pick uh, where I want this blueprint to live. So I'll give the blueprint a name, my ISO spoke. And I'll pick a definition location. This can be either a management group or a subscription. Um, this is a great way to sort of limit uh, what the blueprint can do, where it can be assigned. So let's go to our very successful hotels group. That's our definition location. And then when I switch over to artifacts, uh, I see that artifacts are, are pre-populated. Um, so I am setting up a separate log analytics resource group here. I'm turning on security center. I'm setting up networking. I'm actually peering the VNet in this subscription to the network in the hub subscription. So if there's any on-prem connectivity, this will wire it up um, correctly and immediately um, have the networking be set up correctly. Uh, another key vault, and then uh, the, the main piece of this workload is the SQL database and the app service environment that's built on top of it. And then all I have to do is click Save Draft. And now I have a copy of this blueprint that I can use for assignment. Um, all the blueprints start out as drafts, so you can make as many modifications as you'd like in the draft state. And then when you're ready to assign it, we ask you to publish a version of the blueprint. The reason we ask you to publish a version, we actually make an immutable um, copy of the blueprint. So that 1.0 of the blueprint is 1.0. You can't sort of fudge the version numbers and change things out. There's a copy of, of it in Azure and you can't change it once it's been uh, assigned. And so we can say with confidence that this blueprint with version 1.0 is deployed to all these subscriptions and it helps with updating those environments over time. So I'll publish this, I'll say 1.0. I can give whatever versioning convention I'd like. And now this is ready to be assigned. Uh, I'm gonna switch over to uh, a screen. I lost where I'm supposed to be, so apologies. So I'm updating a blueprint that already exists, but the, the process that you're gonna walk through is exactly the same. So you pick the subscription where you want to assign the blueprint, you give the assignment a name, these are both disabled because I'm updating. Uh, this is where I would pick the version, this is also where I choose the type of lock that I want. I'm using something called a user assigned managed identity. Hands up if you've used managed identities of any kind. Managed identities are awesome. They're really easy to work with. They help uh, resources talk to other resources in the portal. The reason I'm using a user assigned identity is because by default the system assigned identity that we use for the blueprint assignments only has access to the one subscription. Um, but because we're peering across two different subscriptions, this blueprint will need to do a write to the hub subscription. So by using a user assigned identity, it already has access to both subscriptions. It can do the VNet peering. It has enough permissions to do that. And then the rest is just a matter of going through all the different um, parameters that are set up. So I can pick my region. This is gonna be the region where all the resources are deployed. Um, this organization name up top here sets up a naming convention for all the different resources. And then I have my, um, all my IP information, um, which almost definitely will be different um, depending on how you guys have networking set up, but this is a parameter that is exposed to you. So whether you're coming through the UI or you wanna do this in a pipeline, you can feed in the right parameters from wherever you're getting them. The rest of these are all filled out appropriately. And then I just click assign. Uh, obviously this is a time consuming process. There's quite a bit of infrastructure being set up here. Um, so we're not gonna wait for this to finish. 
um, but they work quite well. Um, despite their complexity, they, they work, um, they deploy successfully every time. Um, so that's walking through kind of how you can go about setting up Hub and Spoke. If you're Greenfield, come in, try out the built-in blueprints. They're really easy to work with. There's documentation for both of those that just describes the exact steps and the exact parameter values you need to assign the blueprint successfully. And the last thing I'm gonna talk about is how do I start managing my blueprints as code? So um, I'm bought into blueprints, I think they work really well, but I need to take the next step and start to operationalize these um, and put them in my source control so many people can contribute to them easily. Um, so I have a build pipeline set up here, which I'll, I'll walk through, um, but the first thing I wanna do is kind of walk through how a blueprint as code is structured. So, this is the basic. So the blueprint itself, this is the same exact blueprint that we've been working with. It was uh, all assigned uh, in code. So this was the first one that was locked with all the networking resources. So the blueprint is called Hotels Foundations. I have a main blueprint.json file here. I can set up parameters here. These are blueprint parameters, which means I can use them in whatever artifact I want. I can pass the value to it. And then I have just a single resource group that I want all my artifacts to live under, and I define that here in the blueprint.json file as well. Um, if I want, I can choose to hard code the location and the name, um, or I can choose to set up a parameter or a naming convention, anything that you think you would be able to do, you really can do um, in this JSON file. And then I have a folder of artifacts. And this is where all those different artifacts live. So we talked about modularity and separation of purpose. It's a really important um, thing to understand and implement. Um, so all of these artifacts do a very specific thing. I have a few different RBAC artifacts here. I have that cost center policy and then the network security group, the public IP address and the VNet um, all separated out. And so if I look at one of these templates, um, there's a bit of extra JSON that kind of wraps the template so that it can be turned into an artifact, but this template section here is an unmodified ARM template. So you can reuse all of your ARM templates quite easily. You could even set up a build system that automatically kind of injects the ARM templates into this artifact code um, if you want it to be more dynamic like that. Um, you can set up dependencies, so I have a dependency on the network security group, um, and like we talked about before, if I need to, I can use that artifacts function to pass values back and forth uh, between them. So I wanna make a change to this blueprint. So I realize that I'm actually missing an RBAC assignment that I need um, on uh, the subscriptions and I need to update them. Before I go and update, I wanna test the blueprint update and make sure it continues to work appropriately. Um, so what I have here is the additional um, RBAC assignment. So Liz needs to be a reader on all of the subscriptions for whatever purpose. That's exactly what this artifact does. And um, all I need to do now is commit the changes, push um, to my master branch, and then the pipeline is gonna do the rest. Um, so I will put, uh, commit now and let the pipeline go and then I'll walk through how the pipeline works. Added Liz as reader. Yeah. And then I push to master, which uh, is going to trigger the build. And assuming this happens successfully, we will switch over to the pipeline YAML file. Um, so this works just as well uh, in the UI if you wanna use the UI for your build or release pipelines, but this is build, so we're gonna look at a YAML file. Um, so it's just two tasks. I have some variables set up here. Uh, so I have create blueprint and assign blueprint. And it has a service connection, and then I have the blueprint name, which I provide here, the path to the main blueprint file. So this is that blueprint.json file that we were just looking at, and then a path to the directory of artifacts. 
And what this task is going to do is look at that blueprint JSON file, push that to Azure, and then look at everything in the artifacts file and push uh, all of those individually. So again, you can be super dynamic, add that file to the artifacts directory, and the pipeline will do everything that it needs to do to make sure the entirety of that blueprint definition gets pushed to Azure. And then the second task is for assigning the blueprint. So I'm doing this in build. Um, you could do this in release as well. The reason why I'm doing it um, in build is because I, as the central architect, my job is to make sure that I'm providing blueprints that are working effectively. So not only do I need to push the blueprint to Azure, I actually need to deploy it and make sure that it's testing properly. Um, I like to do that in build. Like I said, you can do that in release as well. Um, and so all this is going to do is um, assign the blueprint to the subscription ID that I've provided. Um, so this version of the extension will just kick off the assignment. We're doing a few more revisions, that's why it's coming soon, to actually make sure that this assigned task will wait until the blueprint assignment is done. And depending on the failure or success of the assignment, the task itself will fail or succeed. So you can know that if the pipeline build succeeds, that means the blueprint itself is working and you can continue to run tasks assuming that that was successful. Let's look at our build. So it's super fast. Um, so I was using just pure PowerShell to do this a couple months ago, and I had to swap an, a, a version of the AZ module. I had to do all these things. It took a long time. Um, this sort of native first class experience is super, super fast. Um, so we can look at the build. And we can see um, the two tasks that we care about are the create blueprint task and the assign blueprint task. This will automatically publish a version, so you don't need to worry about versioning. If you want to set up a different versioning convention, you can do that as well. That's all described in the task. Um, but this is just showing the details of what this task did. Same with the assign task. We can look for our hotel's foundations. I did get a failure, which means I, I broke something. I might have used the wrong principal ID. Um, that happens. Um, so like I said, the reason why the pipeline succeeded was just because it kicked off the assignment successfully. In the next version, this would have failed the, the pipeline itself as well. And I think that's all I have for demos. And Liz is gonna come up and talk about Azure Resource Graph. Thanks, Alex. I'm not going to touch too much on the slide because um, the demo speaks a thousand words. Uh, but for Resource Graph, essentially, um, we have a, uh, we support advanced query language across all of your Azure resources that you have today. There's nothing to onboard. It's already available on your environment. So when you search for Azure Resource Graph today, my pin disappeared. And just for the heck of it, let's do some more subscriptions because we can't really test that scale if I'm really showing you only two subscriptions in there, right? Uh, so let's say that I'm interested in, hey, how many virtual machines do I have in my subscriptions? I'm going to look for my virtual machine. say by subscription ID in this case. I'm going to quickly run the query and boom, like that fast, it just gives me the, vir uh, the virtual machines that I have at each of the subscriptions. Now I can also graph it as a chart as well, so if I'm interested, I can see it based on the bar chart. It really shows I have this one particular subscription that's being used it's way too much. Um, or I can just do a donut chart as well. This looks great. I wanna keep seeing this beautiful dashboard. Um, so I just pinned it to the dashboard. And so now when I go to the dashboard experience, you can see here, I've pinned it on here already. I've also, wait one second. Let me log. 
I'll get in. I've also created uh, this dashboard as well, just to show you some different flares of what you can do with the queries, right? So I may be interested in my virtual machines by family, my SQLs by tier. I may be interested in based on the resource types that I have across my subscriptions. Um, all this information is available in your environment. We also have a pre private preview today of being able to query against cross-tenant as well. So that truly across all the subscriptions that you have access to, um, you will be able to get a visualization of your asset inventory. So in this quick 50 minute session, uh, I think we are, this is actually our first time that we, where we were able to cover four, C, uh, four services in 50 minutes. So um, we went through how you can structure your subscriptions using management group. Azure management group covers, uh, it supports six hierarchies today. So you can have your services, service group, your organization, all that mapped in your um, organizational hierarchy. And then at the very top, there's a root management group. By default, all of your subscriptions within the tenant belongs to the root management group. So that with a single assignment for your RBAC or your policy, you can impact all of those subscriptions as well as any of the newly onboarded ones in the future. We've also touched on policy, the at scale um, control and compliance assessment, where through policy, I just showed you the deny and the append effect. We also have additional effects such as deploy if not exist that's able to do an auto remediation and remediation on your existing resources as well. Blueprints, Alex went through um, how you can quickly stamp out your consistent um, subscription environment. So by using Blueprint definition and assignments, you can make sure that across all of your subscription, you have consistent resources like network that the subscription owners do not have the permissions to delete. Only, you can only make those changes through Blueprint so that you can make sure that the consistency is always there. Lastly, I quickly showed you the resource graph that allows you to explore across all of your resources and have visibility on those items. Now there's three characteristics on all the services that we walk through today. The first is that it's free. So please go use it. Uh, when you start using them, uh, you'll, another thing you'll notice is that secondly, it's enabled by default. So for example, as I showed you for resource graph, there's nothing to turn on. When you start querying it, you'll notice that the, all the resource information and their configurations are already in the store. Same deal with policy and blueprints, where um, we already have these built-in definitions available in your environment so that you can quickly get started by simply assigning those assignments. And that management group, as I, meant, I, as I quickly touched on, the root management group is already on there. Um, so that you can quickly get started on something to um, have the at scale controls. With that, I'm going to switch over to a Q&A. So Alex, if you could come on up. Um, actually, uh, before Q&A, Alex, uh, sorry, Angel, are you ready for, okay, I'll give you, th we'll take two questions first uh, before Angel gives out the Starbucks gift cards. Uh, could you use the mic actually? Uh, I know it's far away, sorry about that. Just go for it. We'll repeat the question. Um, so, for those of us that have invested in Terraform mm -hmm. and infrastructure as code, mm -hmm. um, this looks like a wholesale replacement of that. Um, what's the migration path, or what's the intent? Sure. Uh, for that? Um, so, in some sense, can you repeat the question first? Yes, I can repeat the question. So, if I've already invested in Terraform. Uh, should I be using all these governance services? I think you're mostly talking about blueprints, it sounds like, specifically. Yeah. Um, uh, what, what do I do to migrate, or are these just competitors? Um, so blueprints is just another object in Azure. Uh, what I mean by that is all the same things you can do with any other object, whether it be a VM or a VNet or what have you, you can do with blueprints as well. So you can actually assign blueprints with an ARM template or with the API, the same Azure ARM API uh, that you guys are already used to. And so where I'm going on this is that um, 
there is a lot of interest in generating a blueprint provider for Terraform. And so what you can do is start to carve out kind of larger pieces or components of your infrastructure and then deploy that large piece or large component through Terraform with a, a blueprint provider. Um, so there is a lot of interest. We're talking to um, the Terraform folks right now to get that um, going. There's some work that needs to be done on both sides. But in the meantime, uh, there is the ARM template um, provider in Terraform that you can use um, if you need to do something in the meantime. But great question. Uh, you just need a resource reader access. On the resources that you're trying to query against. scenarios that we have when developers are developing um, ARM templates for the resource groups are to, they're deploying it locally, right? They're testing everything locally first and trying to deploy it. Um, is there going to be any sort of support for either like um, testing resource groups against the policy or any sort of like what if type scenarios? I'll touch what if on policy and then I'll let Alex touch on what if on the blueprints as well. So uh, when we talk about testing policy, right? Uh, there's actually two main aspects to it. One is that our evaluation takes too long. So you just want the evaluation to, take, uh, to go faster. The, the second part that we hear is we are going to roll out these policies that's um, going to be impactful to the environment, like auto remediation. All these things are quite, can be destructive if the definition is not created correctly. So you want an ability to safely deploy that policy and get the compliance status before you actually roll out the um, automatic enforcement. And so both of the areas we're looking into, the second part we actually just started on the, um, on the implementation as well. So the second portion of it where you are assigning the policy under disabled enforcement mode to be able to have the compliance status first and maybe what you wanna do is um, once you have the compliance information, create the remediation task so you bring all of these resources to 100% compliance before you turn on the auto remediation. And so that second portion of the capability, we just started on the implementation. The first portion, we are still exploring on our options. Great question, Alex. And then what if in blueprints, uh, but really what if in ARM um, is a big investment that we've been, we've been making uh, for the past three months and we're gonna continue to invest in it. Um, Basically, uh, just like Terraform plan, we want to be able to test our ARM deployments um, before we click that very big, scary deploy button where all the terrible things happen. Um, so we're going to have a new What If API. Um, we'll have a private preview of it probably in less than a month at this point. Uh, we are going to be doing it in phases. Um, so the first phase uh, we call just a, a resource diff. So this will tell you if a resource is going to get created or, or redeployed, essentially, uh, which was an update, or a delete in the case of a complete mode uh, deployment. Um, that same API is going to be rolled into blueprints as well. So if you're doing an assignment update, we'll do a what if call on all the resources that you want to create. Uh, where what if gets really interesting is the second phase uh, where we, we'll be doing full property diff. So if you do an update on a resource, we'll be able to tell you, hey, here are the properties that are going to change. Um, the challenge there is noise reduction. The basic what if is actually fa fairly straightforward, but there's a, a big difference between what you supply to ARM to create a resource and what ARM gives you back if you want to get the details of that resource. So we need to do some noise reduction there before we want to release uh, the second phase. And then the third phase we call an impact diff, uh, which is what will happen if I actually update this property. So if you've updated any ARM resources uh, in the past, you know certain things can be updated cleanly while others cannot. Uh, so we want to add that metadata to the schemas of the resources so that you know, hey, if I do this update on a VM, it's actually going to require a restart. Or this property can't be updated. You would need to delete it and recreate it. Or this can be updated cleanly. Um, so what if it's a big project for ARM, um, but we're, we're quite excited to, to tackle it and make things easier. Obviously, it goes without saying that that would get tested against the policies that are in that environment. So with that, I'm going to let Angel give out the Starbucks cards uh, before we answer any more questions. So Angel, you're up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank 
<laughs> um, so do I have uh, Melva Swapana present? Michael Kaufman? <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> All right, I guess the lucky last person. So do I have uh, Nitin Shinoy? If I pronounce that correctly. All right, okay. thanks, folks. We'll stay after for questions if you want to ask. Thank you for coming. Uh, sorry, one more thing. I just real so. Given that some of you may not be familiar uh, with the monthly, uh, monthly governance customer call that we have, I cr just created a link for aka.ms slash join governance. So please, uh, if you go in there, you can put in your contact information for us to invite you uh, to our monthly governance call in case you're interested or you want to have additional Q&A sessions. Thank you.